recording without the consent of all participants uh, may be illegal in some jurisdictions. Uh, do I have your consent to record this meeting? Yeah. I consent. It'd be a short, free or die. A yep. short meeting otherwise. Boom. Da. So here we are. Uh, we are in the uh, in the in the middle of our uh, Edward drought, uh, and uh, we are we have um, we have started uh, started getting a little jittery, which means that uh, at this point, I think we actually have to resort to talking to each other. Um, uh, so I guess that's what we're doing now. So this is the first time I had ever done anything like this. I went into it completely unprepared. No sound check, no video check. I didn't even have an understanding of what Google was gonna do with the recorded meeting. I thought they were gonna give us a grid of all four people, but it turns out they do the thing where they just show the person who most recently made noise. Even though I'm not super happy with it, it's still 90 minutes of pretty good conversation. I figured I'd just uh, edit it a little bit and throw it up for our, you, the viewer out there to see. Enjoy. Uh, hi, welcome to our virtual round table. Um, this is where we talk normally would talk about the game that we just streamed uh, at the heavy cardboard studio But we haven't just streamed any game at the heavy cardboard studio So you get you get the part where where we talk it's like the lucky charms With just the marshmallows. I think I think that's a fair okay. assessment Or maybe it's the lucky charms without the marshmallows and it's just the frosted <laughs> oat bits that the kids don't actually like to eat I have no idea. I guess we'll find out <laughs> I'm a marshmallow. Uh, I'm a marshmallow. <laughs> Martin. Martin's the marshmallow. That's good. Good to know. Good to know. Um, so I think what I'll do is uh, start with the uh, obligatory, uh, what game are we playing right now? And uh, I would say we go around the table on my screen. Uh, John is in the upper left. So maybe we start that way uh, because it makes sense to me. And we go around the table that way. So let's start with John. Hey, John. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. So in the last couple of weeks, I've been I've, I've been fortunate enough to play quite a quite a few games actually. Um, one game uh, that actually is somewhat new. My wife got my, my my wife and I play a lot of games, and she typically almost always beats me, um, which <laughs> yeah. is fine with me because that means I have a gaming partner. Yeah, you know? true. Um, but we played a game that was it's it's fairly light. It's called Botany. Uh, it came out recently. It's it's beautiful. I mean, the, it's it takes place in the 19th century. Um, it's Darwinian themed in the sense that uh, it's about explorers around that time looking for plant life around the the world um, uh, out of England. And you, you, what you're doing is you're going around the world collecting different plant life, collecting it in your specimen jars, and um, it's essentially set collection. Um, it's it's really simple. I mean, you you resolve some events and you roll some dice, and um, it's just kind of just a fun relaxation Sunday game. Um, but it, it's just a beautiful production. Uh, so you know that's fun. Uh, Botany. Uh, she really liked that. Then I I played some uh, Gallerist Solo. Have you guys played Solo Gallerist? Yeah, before? I've tried it a couple of times. Uh, yeah, okay. it's um I've got it right there. Yeah, it there. I haven't yeah. played it solo though. It, it's, uh, you know, some of his solo bots are pretty complicated. Um, and maybe, Ken, you can attest this too, but the Gallerist solo is so is super, super simple. simple. Yeah. yeah. It's it's very nice. Um, if you're familiar with the Gallerist, you know, he, he just moves around in the four spots, move him around, and um, he, he'll, he'll, he'll have you take the kicked out actions, and his uh, workers will cover some of the... Um, what they call the auction spots and it's just a lot of fun. Here. Let me let me get the box. Hold on. I mean we've got it right here. Visual yeah. aid. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's just a really elegant solo that I enjoy. And I, what's funny about that is we had um we went through a power outage a couple of weeks ago up here in New Hampshire. We had we're out power for four days. That was brutal. Um I mean thankfully I have a generator but I was playing gallerist in the dark. There we go. Um, there we go. with my See, headlamp on and that was kind of fun. So you got the yep. bot that moves around to those four spaces there. Those four spots, yeah. Yep, those four yep. spots, and and handles all the and handles all the kickout actions and stuff. If you haven't played the Gallerist, uh, you don't know what a kickout action is, but the kickout actions are pretty cool. Yeah, yep, yeah, super simple. Um, 
Then I played a game called uh, Banish the Snakes, a uh, GMT game. Uh, kind of a questionable theme. Um, it's about, uh, I feel like 14th century Ireland. And what you're doing is you're, um, you're, you're part of the Christians and you're converting the pagans to Christianity. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it really depends on who you play that one with. Um, I enjoyed it for a period of time, but it kind of felt um, like pandemic to me. You know, you're just kind of going around putting out fires. Those pesky pagans. Just <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it yeah. co-op? Uh, it is co-op. I played it solo. Um, it's essentially the same thing. Um, but it's a really nice production. I just, um, you know, the theme didn't really strike me too too much. I guess you kind of have to be into that. And it was a little bit too simple uh, for my taste. But I can, I can really see how it's a, a very unique theme. And some people will probably enjoy that game. Um, we played some Calico, um, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. It's yeah. uh, like Cascadia and that and that tiling sense, really puzzly. Um, but I think my my favorite game, besides Age of Steam, I played a, a few Age of Steam games, but um, a game, two games by Hollenspiel, um, Heading Forward, uh, which is about, uh, it's a solo game about someone with a traumatic brain injury. Oh, and yeah. yeah, what you're doing is, and it's a little bit um, cynical, but you're trying to beat the clock. And what the clock is, is your insurance running out. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I work in healthcare, so I'm, I'm pretty oh. familiar with that. Oh, boy. But, but you start out with very limited skills because you're, you're trying to recover from a TBI. And uh, it's, you, you have this, these cards that you play with. And you have spoons that represent your mental capacities. Um, there's ways to make money and you know work on washing dishes and reading and all kinds of basic skills that you would learn uh, from healing from a TBI. And by the end of the game, you've kind of developed all these skills and hopefully you've done it before your insurance coverage runs out. But it's a really interesting game. Is um, that designed like, by Amabel Holland? No, it's uh, uh, designed by John Dubois, okay. I believe his name is, um, sure. but it is a Holland Spiel production. Um, but the other game I was talking about that um, is designed by Amabel is called The Field of the Cloth of Gold. Oh yeah, so that's okay. on. Um, yeah, have you, play, you guys played that before? I have, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's on a site called Rally the Troops. That's what I've been playing. I heard from Edward. I uh, was talking about that actually. It's fun. and I just wanted that's to read. Game. Yeah, I wanted to read the description of this game. Sure. Um, real quick, but uh, it was created to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the world's most famous three-week party, in which King Henry VIII of England and Francis I of France spent ridiculous amounts of money and resources to peacock at each other. <laughs> so essentially they're just, you know, angrily gifting each other. Yeah. Um, I bought you the nicer thing. Well, I bought yeah. you the nicer thing. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and the way she describes it is it's, it harkens back to the feel of the classic German games of the 1990s. Yeah. Simple, yeah. elegant, austere, and politely vicious. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's just a lot of fun. I mean, it's simple, it's uh, tactical. Um, and and I, I highly recommend that. And then uh, I want yeah, just... to put a pin in these last two games that you discussed and keep, you know, mm -hmm. by all means, keep talking uh, about, about other stuff you've been playing, but I want to remember these because it's going to be relevant for a future discussion topic. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and then just I, I played uh, Brooklyn on stream, Age of Steam. I really enjoy Age of Steam solo, so I played uh, Puerto Rico um, and Iceland uh, by myself. Those are great. And um, I played New England with my wife and uh, Rust Belt with a couple of friends. So, yeah, it's been a good couple of weeks. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Martin, regale us. Yeah, well, the main thing that occurs to me that I did recently was uh, I went last Saturday, I went to the game group I used to go to more regularly up in at Meets up in Beverly Library. And they have a monthly um, day, Saturday day meeting, which I, we don't normally do because that's when we do our heavy cardboard group. And uh, I showed up there and uh, somebody had got the Great Western Trail New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Yep. Tried before. So we got that out. I've played Greston, Great Western Trail maybe three or four times since it came out so not very often and enough that i kind of know the basic flow of the game but not the great details of it um but i've heard about the new zealand game and uh, it adds quite a few extra little bits and bobs um it's sheep now rather than cows 
yeah. um, which makes no difference to the thematic <laughs> integrity of the game, because let's face it, there's no thematic integrity to the game anyway. Um, and it adds most noticeably, it adds a new action, a new worker type. So in, in, in Great Western Trail, for those who don't know, the game is very much driven by these three kinds of workers you can get, the, the cowboys, the construction workers, whatever they're called, and the railway engineers. And depending on which ones you specialize on, it depends on your engine building. Well, with um, Great Western Trail New Zealand, they make some cosmetic changes. The railway people become sailors because you have to sail to places in New Zealand. Because, by the way, you can't build a railway from New Zealand to San Francisco or even to Sydney. Not with or that even attitude. To Auckland if you start in Wellington. <laughs> um but um the main thing they add is they add uh, sheep shearers so when you're collecting your sheep not just can you go to wellington as in this in this game and sell them for their meat you can also shear them at some random spot on on your rondelle and sell them for wool and get some money that way which is quite an interesting feature because it allows you to get money in the middle of your rondelle loop usually in the game you can only get really get serious money at the end of your loop. And so it adds a little well, bit. They throw in a few other things as well. There's a uh, there's a track called a, a navigator track, which is what I refer to as a temple track, some boring track that gives you powers if you advance upon it. So I wasn't so keen on that. Um, but it's not a huge amount of extra stuff to the game, but it certainly adds some extra options. During the game, those of us playing it, and the other four people, three had played uh, regular Great Western Trail a few times, and one, it was completely new to it. The three of us who played before kind of agreed, we actually think we prefer um, New Zealand. The extra options it gave us, we felt, were, were nice extra options. But later on that night, sitting and thinking about it, as in the evening, as I tend to with my glass of whiskey and, you know, thinking about, you know, what do I think about it? I wasn't so sure that New Zealand does add a bunch of extra rules. Um, and although it gives you some extra options, I'm not sure the extra rules are really worth it. And in particular, what worries me more about it is things like this um, temple track, and also to some extent the sheep shearing, give you other ways to score victory points. And it's one of the things I've learned about my little feelings about games is, the more ways there are to score victory points, the more I feel the game is diffuse and lack, lacks that kind of focus on what you're trying to do. And that tends to irritate me in the longer term. And so I felt, hmm, I'm not sure whether that's actually that's going to be an improvement or not, because it's not as if it's a super focused game at the beginning. And further dilution of that focus is probably not great. Now, having said that, Great Western Trail is a really good game. Um, I don't own it, but it's a game I would quite happily buy if I was in the mood to buy another game. So my overall thoughts about New Zealand are still mixed. I, it's a plausible option. Should I actually get a Great Western Trail game at some point? I'm not sure whether I'd go New Zealand or regular second edition. Um, but it was certainly worth playing. It was, it was quite good fun. Have you tried uh, Argentina? No, I have not tried Argentina. Now, I were the seen... sheep were they were they cubes or were they sheep? <laughs> they are they are cards. They are they are in yeah. your mind, John. Okay. Yeah. They um the I, I before if you do decide to purchase a Great Western Trail game, I would recommend tra tracking down and playing a copy of Argentina and see what you feel about that. Uh, I think there's there's a triangle of Great Western Trail, and I think. Um, the base, you know, does the base game does what it does when you play the base game. I don't know how much it matters now to think about it. Do you know when you've played the base game, did you play the first or second edition? Did it have both? Oh, okay, both. And then when you played the second edition, did you play it with uh, rails to the north? No, okay, so there you have some options, right? Um, and then track down a copy of Argentina, and then from there, now you have made your full now you can make a fully informed decision of whether or not you are going to purchase uh, a Great Western Trail game. I, I have all three and uh, uh, Rails to the North for the second edition as well. Uh, and I love all of them. Uh, I'm, I like uh, all of them so much that I bought that mechanism again with uh, Maracaibo, which is not on this shelf, and Boone Lake, which is on this shelf, which is 
uh, travel this path and do these things along the path. And then once you reach the end of the path, you loop back to the start of the path again. Um, now, interestingly, I, like I do have a copy of Bloom Lake, but I don't want to. I don't want to play it. Uh, I don't want to break the shrink on it until I play it because I didn't buy it. Oh. It came as it was a heavy con last year. They had some giveaways. Sure. And one of my giveaways was Boom Light. So yeah. it's sitting there on the shelf. And I'm thinking, you know, I've not heard great things about it. I'm not sure whether I actually want to keep this game. Yeah. So if I don't want to keep it, I don't want to break the shrink. But on the other hand, how do I know if I like it or not unless I break the shrink? So I'm in that kind of play play situation with Boom Light until sometime I can get a chance to play it. Well, tell you what, I'll next time. Next time we meet up, I I can bring Boone Lake, and you can and you can borrow it and crack into it. I also have the expansion, the artifacts expansion, um, that you probably won't want to mess with. Um, uh, you know, as your for your for your first play, it adds a second board for you to move around and get some powers on and stuff. Um, but uh, the base game, Boone Lake, um, it's all right. It it takes the the like I said, the moving down the the track and and deciding what you want to get there and introduces this neat mechanism where there's seven total available actions in the game and you and you you pick one of the seven and then that one that you pick goes to the bottom of the list and it becomes not as beneficial if it gets picked multiple times in a row by different players it it actually it, it the game encourages you to pick the action that people haven't picked in a while so you you get that that cycling through uh kind of thing uh i i dig it i liked it which is why it's right there it's harder than it it's harder than a than you'd think to point at a shelf in reverse you keep doing that you're gonna get stuck I, <laughs> my face will get stuck this way ken what are you playing uh what have i played recently so yeah. um over the weekend uh had a friend in town and we played um a couple of different times age of innovation at a couple of different player counts i'd never played it two before so i was excited to get it done at two um and reconfirm my opinion that it's an amazing it game yeah age of innovation very um good. so um at last time we were at martin's which was that last weekend or two weekends ago martin two weekends ago we played among other games taj mahal which i thought was wonderful i'd never played before oh man i let that game go mm. and i regret it and yeah it's it's mm. What did you say? Politely vicious, John? Yeah. Yeah, politely vicious. I'm not yeah. sure how polite it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it was I don't remember vicious. much politeness about it's vicious. But it was it's certainly awesome. vicious. Um, that one was great. Um, I feel like that game that game is ripe for another uh, for a remake, uh, like or for a reprint, like Amun Ray got and like Ra yeah. got. I think someone someone somewhere at Alley Cat Games or someplace is just gonna pick that up and 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 re-release it. And I think it it'll probably do well. Yeah. Um, one thing that we do here at my school every year, or the kids try to do every year, although sometimes they plan better than others, is that the board game club here, uh, of which I am the advisor, um, uh, does a sleepover in the library where they can play games all night. Sure. Um, so because I am the, because I'm the advisor of the club, I'm sort of roped in as a chaperone for this boondoggle. Sure. Um, so we did that a couple of weeks ago and, uh, one of the games I played there uh, that I, I was sort of like a near miss disappointment is the game Chronicles of Crime. Have you guys played this game before? Heard about it, haven't played it yet. So it's a detective style game, um, and it uses an app. And one thing the app does is really wonderful, which is that when you get to a crime scene, um, Martin, you actually are you, are you in space see... now? Mart Martin's in 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 the Midlands. It looks like brass. Oh, that's right. Sorry about that. I was fiddling around. I've been trying to find this backwards. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> now the important um, things have been taken care of. Continue. Yeah. So when you reach a crime scene, you can actually use the app to sort of like get get some sort of oh yeah some um, uh, augmented intelligence or yeah. No, well, no, you get um, like Evidence. a like a VR perspective of like yeah. you can do like a you know full surround sure. and see all the surroundings so you, you go through the process of like looking around and calling out potential clues yeah um it's really neat and you know the sort of the puzzle of you know, sort of like trying to solve the crime is fun there's a lot lots of games that do that to various degrees of success um but the the place where i felt like the game really fell down is that like 
there's some real usability issues. Like you're calling out, like there's a huge stack of things that could be clues. Yeah. And so you're calling out like, oh, there's a knife. And so then you, in the stack, there might be weapon, but also kitchen implement. Oh, yeah. And so ideally you'd want the game to sort of know that both are correct, but it doesn't. So if you guess the wrong one, you just like lose five minutes. And oh. of course you're, you're scored based on your time. Sure. So, so you can't um, use a whisk as a weapon. <laughs> if you move it fast enough right you're, you're, you're sort of you're, you're a lot of, we've spent by the end sort of a fair amount of time discussing whether this would be like this thing or this thing which seems like beside the point of the game and so it was like there are some really cool things about it but did, didn't love it it was ken in the library with the spatula that's it, that's it. <laughs> um uh i play with another group and we are in the middle of uh our frost haven campaign so we're about 20 scenarios in that's been amazing um and i would say for those who've played gloomhaven all the way through and really loved it and wanting more it's sort of the perfect next step i uh, definitely would not start with frost haven i would be remiss if i didn't mention that the laptop that is recording this right now is sitting on a frost haven box <laughs> that, that i have i have promised uh, my wife we will get to this summer uh because nothing says you know, summer like Frosthaven. So you haven't That's played right. it yet, Paul. Uh, there we, is a we we played all the way through Gloomhaven, uh, and we started Frosthaven, and we got like a mission or two in, and I said, "Oh man, we have too many games on the shelf of opportunity to dive into Frosthaven right now, but we will." And and through continuous strenuous effort, we have gotten that shelf down to where I feel comfortable being able to dive into. Frosthaven, I can see it. It's, I told her the other day, Frosthaven is on the horizon. It, it's coming. We are getting use out of it. Yeah. Just holding up your, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Isaac would be proud. <laughs> what else you got, Ken? Uh, I think that's about it for me. What about you, Paul? Uh, let's see. Last night we played, hold on. Uh, last night we played, we got a couple of plays over the last couple of days. We got a, a plays of the Rats of Worcester right here. And, um, uh i i what i i told laura i you know the simone i don't know if that's luciani with a c a heart you know the italian c or if it's luciani I, i'm not sure hard c yeah hard c yeah, Lu um, luciani i am yeah. I, I i you know he's they he's part of that italian that i call in my head the italian crew right and they did like they've done the games like grand austria hotel uh lorenzo golem i think please correct me mm -hmm. if i'm wrong i'm just off, i'm just going those are right yep. here. yeah and those are like roll the dice and pick the dice that correspond to the action you want to do and there's none of that in rats um rats is is instead like here's the wheel of actions and just put a mouse on the action you want to do and that is very different than what i usually get from one of those uh types of games and i was a little hesitant um but it turns out that that is a delicious puzzle because the action that you pick around that wheel is kind of useless unless you have your little helper mice around the outside of that wheel boosting the strength of that action. So it becomes this puzzle of moving your mice around so that they're going to be in the right place at the right time so that when you take the action with your big mouse, they're there to help you. So instead of getting one medal, maybe you get four medal instead of being able to dig one spot out you can dig three spots out. You know, it's all about plan, 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 turn efficiency. Martin, it seems like the kind of game that would just be like right up your alley. Cause I know, I know just my, my, my feeling is that you're a fan of games that let you plan, you know, given how much you like Kalos and given how much you like that kind of forward planning, low luck kind of game, being able to sit there and plan, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. Um, I usually have a hard hard time getting into those, but rats, I think, makes it just just bearable for this kind of dum dum forward planning brain. I like a lot more tactical game, um, which is why like I've played the heck out of Terraforming Mars. Right, you don't know what you're going to play until you get the cards in front of you, and rats has a little bit of that too because there's two huge decks of invention cards um, that you can collect over the course of the game, and those really define what you're going to specialize in um all driving to the goal of you know getting victory points like all these games are um uh, by uh digging out your your rat area underground digging out uh rooms filling them with beds 
and exploring the house, ultimately getting down into the basement to get the cheese. That's pretty cool. Um, if you can get all the way down there, don't open the door for other people to get the cheese. Uh, if anyone's watching this, that's good life video, advice in general. Just don't open the door for other people to get the cheese. That's <laughs> that's just something you should just take with you. And then also, well, that that theme, Paul, it's basically the secret of Nim, right? Of Nim, which is great. It, yeah. yeah, it it you know it it seems like the kind of thing where if they had just paid a little bit more money, they would have just themed it after Nim. But um, but you know they wisely that's decided, pretty cool. Wisely decided not to. And then also, we've played this. Mm. Malem, have you guys heard of this game? Yeah. Uh, yep. we, uh, this was a huge hit at PAX Unplugged. Uh, I, every time I passed by the table at PAX Unplugged, there were people sitting down trying to learn how to play it. And I just slide right in being like, would you like to learn how to play Malem Space Agency? And I would just teach them. And most of the time, they would then invite me to sit down and play, which is you know, win-win for everybody. Now, do you know why it's called Malem, what that is? Yeah, it's a little, I think it's like the, the sound or the act of the cat, like licking its own nose or something. Yeah, can you do it? Me? There, uh, there. <laughs> no, Martin, just, Martin was just doing it. Was, no, that's oh, something you have to subscribe to my OnlyFans for. My <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll put a link that's, in the description well, below. That's paid oh, content. Martin. That's yeah. paid content. We're giving, I don't just give that away for free. Malem is great. Um, Martin does. There is a ver there is a if you go get it in stores, it comes, I believe, like duct taped or scotch taped to the outside of the box, a little mini expansion called Blep, which I think okay. uh involves dogs. Dog so it's like the same thing for dogs, I think. Yeah. yeah, like there's just extra there's extra astronauts, I think, that instead of just like the eight or or ten cat astronauts, there's just some dog astronauts you can throw in there as well. Cos Cosmo dogs or whatever they're called. Um yeah, Malem, Malem is great because, you know, I'm surrounded by people who love cats and uh, and the the value on this on this is great. It was like 30 bucks and you come with and it comes with this stitched play mat and uh, and uh, and, and this, the wooden ship and uh, nice, thick, chunky cardboard tokens. Uh, I think it's, I think it's really cool. And then those are the lighter games I played. And then we got, oh, it's, oh, did I just take it off? I would really love to try that lamb at some point. I'm hearing very good things about it. So well, then, Martin, life. I will bring Boone Lake. Oh, man. Boone Lake. And I will bring Malem to the next time we have a game day or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would be happy to let you borrow them. And I think it's important to mention to potential um, watchers of this stream that it's a Penitia game. Yeah, oh, so yeah. It, uh, that's immediate attention. Yeah, here's the thing. Yeah, it's right there. It's um it's the it, it 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 doesn't look like a Kinesia game, right? It doesn't it it um it feels like a Kinesia game, but when you think of Kinesia, you think of like how beige can you go and uh <laughs> or how you know how mathy can you get? And uh and this is this is um it's almost like Kinesia does can't stop or something like that, right? Uh, I really like it. Well, there's um, so there's like another it. game that he did a while back. It's a you're you're on like a blimp, and it's also oh. like a pressure luck game. Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of the name of that one. And it sounds like this kind of re-implements that, but with a little bit more Chrome, a little bit more rules. Maybe I I have yeah. all the games he designed. The chances are good. What you just described, he did. <laughs> i would say there's a multiverse in which kinesia has designed every possible game but i, I think we're in that yeah we're there universe right now yeah. and then uh if we go back just a little further what i'm proud of is we collectively as a group uh finally beat uh return to dark tower uh on but don't get too excited on normal mode without any expansions <laughs> Uh, Lauren this is I, heavy cardboard, not normal cardboard. <laughs> I know. I feel great shame. <laughs> uh, Laura and I played it two player when we got it and, uh, and we beat it and we were like, this game's easy. And then we tried playing four player and we tried it 10, like 10 times and we just couldn't do it we, because there was just, I think it just gets, I think there's just way more, you know, just like a pandemic kind of thing. There's just way more fires than, than we knew how to put out. And then we finally we finally stumbled on the right combination of things, and we took a couple risks that we probably shouldn't have, and you know, burr, 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 and we did it, and it felt it felt really good. Uh, next up, gritty mode. Um, that is, mm. uh, yeah, gritty mode. That is not where the mascot of the Philadelphia Flyers swings in and starts like you know flossing while you're trying to play. 
Uh, instead, that is they just make the game harder. And then I have the two expansions for it that we haven't even touched other than other than to use the extra characters. But like there's the different colored skulls and there's the different guilds you can align with. And then the second expansion has even more plastic miniatures and monuments and stuff. And there's all kinds of content in mine there. I don't I don't know how there's not enough time in the day, man. There's not enough time in the day. Uh, but speaking of expensive Dark Tower, that is a perfect segue, Paul to my next question that I wanted to float around, which is, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, guilty pleasures or lu luxury games, luxury game, luxury items. Is there something that jumps out at you in that you have either purchased in recent memory or a game that you have decided, um, man, I really like that game and I just want to kit it out or I want to spend as much money as possible on that game and have like no regrets at all. Um, is is there anything that, that jumps out at you like that? We can go back around the wheel again. John, do you have anything like that? Um, probably my recent fascination with splatter games. I mean, they yeah. are not cheap. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just throw out Roads and Boats. I, I got that recently. How much? And how um, much? How much was that? Um, it was <laughs> under two hundred and over one hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it's the twentieth anniversary edition too. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And the reason it was such a splurge is because I'd never played it before, so I was taking a risk. Um, but I, I know I knew how it worked. I'd watched, I read the rules, and that's kind of how I based that stuff off. And I love it. Great. I just I love that game. I can play it solo. Um, it's just so kitschy. You know, you you have a mar you have a piece of plastic, and you write with a marker on it. And, yeah. Um, and uh, and I think the art artwork is really cool, even though it looks like an eight year old drew it. I, just, <laughs> I, I think it's awesome. And, it's stylized. Yeah, it's stylized. Yeah. So that was that. That's definitely a guilty pleasure. It's not something for everybody, and it was not cheap. So, um, you know, I can justify my Lacerda games, even though they're expensive, just because they're so well produced. And yeah, I know I'm generally going to like them, but Roads and Boats was certainly a risk, and it was it was worth it. So. What did you think of that? Uh, the um, food chain magnet that the game found that they kicked off. Yeah, I'm, I didn't back that. I love Food Chain Magnate too, but I just don't... Do I'll you, play it. Do you $400 love it? I think my friend is getting but, it. Um, I like the original production. I think it's cool. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mark, yeah, about you? I mean, when it comes to games, because I don't buy very many, I only buy about five or six a year, which you know, is pitifully low by the standards of people on this call um i don't worry sure. too much about that and i am quite happy to buy the high-end game so you know i did get the rar i did get the special castles of burgundy i don't mind buying stuff from eagle griffin which is also expensive and yes i do get all the age of steam expansions or whatever but i don't see those as guilty pleasures yeah i was just gonna say i i in your video uh i saw that you had like expansion volume one two three four i was a, a little jealous of that i i wish i played enough to justify buying them yeah, I, I'm quite happy to get every expansion they just do. In fact, I've got another box with some older maps sure. in it as well that they made available at the first Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, I haven't yet got to the point of uh, printing out print and plays or sending off um, <laughs> stuff to France for Alban Viard's maps, but I, it could well happen. I mean, it's that's only a matter of time. And I do have a complete set of the Steam Rails Riches maps as well, which we haven't even begun mm -hmm. to break into yet. So. I mean, yeah, I am, def and I did go. Um, I didn't, or, or I did make a special uh, purchase from Germany to get the Age of Industry map. So yeah, I was going to Germany anyway, so it wasn't so bad. So yeah, I don't think of any of that. So if I do any splurging now, it's uh, <laughs> it's this kind of stuff. Oh, the, wait. Uh, I can, oh yeah. What is that? My packs of cards. Oh yeah, that's true. So that's if true. you look at the video I did, you I did for the um, Taylor's thing. Um, if you look at the bottom, um, I guess, left looking at the video, you will see a shelf full of these long, thin boxes. Those are my boxes of playing cards. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of playing cards. Yeah, sure. And they're beautiful. I mean, I I, I, I think the, the artwork on them is magnificent. I don't get to play with them very often, but they're absolutely gorgeous to uh, play around with or just... You know, I might play a game of patience or something with them. Not really for the game of patience, but just to enjoy the playing cards. Is and I really any... want to actually get some of us to start playing some regular card games. There's all these, 
really good um, shedding games from East Asia, which are the kind of the the inspiration for games like Pichu and the like. But uh, seem like really good games, but people don't play them. They always play the commercial games. And I'd like to actually get to play the original 52 card pack games because, you know, it's a great things you can do with a regular pack of cards. I've heard 100 million people, 100 million Chinese play Tichu every day, according to the uh, the back of the box. As huh. uh, that's what it's. <laughs> no, that is patently false. Tichu is <laughs> Tichu, Tichu is about as as Chinese as anything that is not Chinese. I I was going to say this guy. Well, but... you can tell because in Tichu, the highest card is I think an ace. Sure. But in Chinese games, the highest card is always a two. The mm. highest. So does it do they count um do they count like one? Do they skip the two? Like one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then and then top it off with a two? Or is it is it some for some other reason? So if they go Jack Queen, King, Ace, Two, and the lowest cards are three. And the lowest um, card, oh, all of the rules I've read for the East Asia climate games use this huh. uh, mechanism, which is weird to us Westerners, but yeah, that's, that's how they do it. And I, was, yeah. I mean, I've got, I, I've read, you know, I've got a Paget, which is the card game site, and they have a dozen different versions of, of these East Asian climbing games from yeah. China or Vietnam or whatever, which are minor variations on each other. And Teach is just another minor variation on that. And I'd love to actually try these things because I never played those growing up. When I was young, I played a lot of bridge, I played a lot of hearts, I played Canasta, I played PK, I played Bazique. I played lots of these kind of card games because you know board games were crap in those days. But I never played these East Asian climbing uh, climbing games because they just weren't around. The time. I'd love to give those a shot. I mean, that sounds great. Sure. How many yeah. decks of cards do you think you have, Martin? Um. Well, each brick box is twelve. Um. And you can see on my shelf, I've probably got about. 10, 15 brick boxes, and then I've got another 10 on another shelf. So more than I should. This is Martin. He goes through several packs. <laughs> Don't be like Martin. Yeah. No, I yeah. take it back. We, we yeah. should all be. We should all be like Martin. Sometimes you see on uh, streams that uh, Martin has brought a deck of cards for us to use as a randomizer. Yeah. Um, and I think you could probably tell a little bit of how beautiful the cards are from the streams, but you probably can't, you don't get the full effect. There are some really lovely decks of cards at Martin's house. I feel like you can use Edward as a gauge, um, cause he'll usually have like a strong, he'll usually have like big, whoa, kind of a, a big reaction on a scale of, of, you know, you call that like a 0. 0.3 Edward. Then you're like, oh, it's probably just like, you know, an average. But if you get like a 0. 0.7 Edward, you know that it's probably, you know, uh, what is it? Filigreed with gold or whatever, you know, <laughs> lined with gold. Ken, what about you? Um, yeah, I don't think I've bought anything that I would consider a guilty pleasure purchase in a while. Sure. Um, uh, I am very tempted by Edward's collector's edition of Twilight Struggle, though. Is, is it Edward's specifically? Like, are you planning on doing harm to Edward in order to get your hands on it? Because that, that would be a little... I mean, that's, I hadn't thought about that, but that's actually not a bad that's idea. That's a high that you price to pay, my friend. <laughs> um, but, what good uh, is it if it costs you your soul? Yeah, I don't, I don't know how much it would run on the, on the open market, but I'm guessing <laughs> in, in the several hundreds of dollars. So maybe it actually might be cheaper in some ways to just <laughs> take Edward out. <laughs> Yeah. Um it's a lovely production though. So I, I I have a I have a perfectly fine one, but I I'm envious of that of that production. So thanks to John, as has been documented uh in various videos, uh I immediately boy Paul, I immediately uh went out and bought Wonderland's War, mm. the deluxe edition with the fancy chips, uh and the miniatures, which uh are this is my this is my miniature cabinet right here. It is shamefully bare after recently getting rid of a couple of Warhammer armies for that I don't play anymore. Um, and so I need to fill it with something. So may as well spend spend big for the for the good looking miniatures for the game I really like. Um, and I uh, I had a hard time I had a hard time pulling the trigger on that one. But I you know it's just one of those things where you say 
I, you know, a day goes by, you try to give yourself a day or two to say, do I really want this? Do I really want this? And the day goes by and the next day goes by and you go, yeah, yeah, I really want this. And you, when you press that button, you could have got the coin capsules. I, uh, but I, I did the coin capsule thing with uh, quacks. I did. And I didn't uh, like it. Um, I, I just, I didn't like it. Um, uh, it, it's not the same thing. It just, uh, I don't know if you've tried the deluxe chips yet. This, uh, this now this is not sponsored content, by the way. I paid money for that, but I don't know if you've if you've if you've tried the deluxe chips. They're they're good. They're they're like the geek. They're like a geek up bit set or that kind of thing. And uh, and then and then the miniatures are also very very good. And those are in my my queue, my painting queue down in my painting dungeon. Um, that that there, and then the Dark Tower. That was the first thing I ever kickstarted because I played mm -hmm. a lot of Dark Tower as a kid. Mm -hmm. I I used to have it back, you know, back in the eighties when it was, when it was out, I used to like, when it was bedtime, it'd be time to go to bed. And you know, if I like couldn't sleep or whatever, I would just grab the dark tower unit, turn it on and like play the game in my head. Um, and like, imagine my, me moving the models around in my head, playing the game and just pressing the buttons on the tower. Uh, and so when they announced this, uh, I said, yes, please even though it was cooperative and I'm not a big fan of cooperative games, I still had to get my hands on it. And then they were nice enough to introduce during the campaign, a competitive, competitive mode that I haven't even tried yet, but um, and there's no relation to Stephen King, right? No, it's not. Um, I'm not even sure that the dark tower books were even out at the time. I'd have to consult Wikipedia, but no, definitely not. I think the, the gunslinger came out in the, the late early eighties, late seventies, seventies. Okay. 70s? okay. Not, then I, yeah. then I love that series. It's, it's a, it's a, good series yeah, that, that series that series is it's one of those series that they will never they keep they will continue to try to film and they will never get yeah. it right no. because you just can't because everyone in the evolve and in the everyone in the production of the film would need to be on just mountains of drugs in order to really pull <laughs> that off uh yeah. like just just, just we're crazy they would be like i have become drugs <laughs> and, and now i can make this movie so though, yeah, those are the two things right there, which is why they are prominently and proudly displayed there. And then also I have the, uh, you can't see it, but I have the uh, miniatures for Anachrony as well that I painted up that I, that I also splurged on. Um, so now that we've all bragged about the expensive games we have, let's talk about the games that we really, really like, but other people don't seem to be on the same train. Um, uh, and not the big giant like pink train or flesh, flesh colored train is that what's that what the color of the the train in the dark tower is i don't remember his name oh it's oh from the blaine. book series it's pink it's yeah blaine. It's blaine blaine yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um not that train but the train where you're like look i like this game and if i go on board game geek i see that nobody else seems to like it um does anyone have any good examples of games that um that, that they like that board game geek doesn't seem to. And I'm defining this as, I think we all know that, I mean, I think, I think we all know you go on board game geek and they have, they ostensibly have a one to 10 rating system, but I think we all know that their rating system is actually seven to eight. Um, if nothing, very rarely do things get higher than an eight, maybe like the tippy tippy top of the, of the list of the games, you know, get higher than an eight. And if it's, and, and, again maybe i'm wrong but like if it's below seven most most of the time it's because there's people in there just who just have flooded it with one star reviews and then people who flooded it with 10 star reviews and and that's about it um you know so the you know, major reason for this is because part of their system is they basically start every game with i, I don't know how many but sort of thousands of seven i think it's seven point reviews yeah and the idea is this is to lower the problem with small numbers because if you've got a game that's only got 10 people who've rated it and they all rate it really high it's going to shoot to the top of the table and it's not really representative because it hasn't got enough reviews to really be representative right so the idea is that kind of adds us ballast <clears throat> to the system so that you've got to have a combination both of good ratings but also a lot of ratings to get your game to push up or indeed to descend down which i think is a good way of doing it and i think it, it you know given the circumstances of what they're trying to do it actually works fairly well but that's why everything floats around this base number of seven which is what everybody seems to think the average of what it was which doesn't work for money right <laughs> so with that with that said are i'm wondering um and we can take a second to look it up and to look if you have your i'm sure we all have our collection logged in board game geek 
um, take a second, look up your collection, and uh, and see if you have any games that are that you really like that other people seem to have rated a six point nine or lower. Yeah, you know, it's I, interesting. I, I did, there's three. Yeah, for me. Okay. yeah, and and so they fall into two categories. Um, two of them are mass market games that I think board gamers tend to thumb their nose at. So um, in both cases, I have the game rated an eight while they're rated below a seven. Um, so all, all three cases actually. So one game is Scrabble, which I think is great. I love Scrabble. Good game, yeah. I don't, I don't, I feel, don't really feel like I have to say much about Scrabble. I mean, I think everybody's probably played Scrabble. Um, yeah. I like oh, it. I, actually, I do have something to say about it because it's interesting. Um, I never, oddly enough, I don't like Scrabble very much, and I've oh. never liked it, even as a, as a kid. But I did visit this fantastic article, um, and we should post it in the show notes, by one of these guys who, who's a board game blogger, who talks about how to play Scrabble properly, mm. and how it's not at all about knowing words. It's all about tactical positioning on the, on the board, on the board. Yeah. And yeah. It's, a, it's like a revelation. You read that and you say, oh, Scrabble is a totally different game to the game I always imagined it to be. Um, and if I if I can dig that out, I'll, everybody who is even considering Scrabble needs to read that to understand how different Scrabble really is to uh, what it could be. But my favorite variant of Scrabble was one that a bunch of people in, in the UK used to play. It was obscene Scrabble. <laughs> Every word you had to be posted in Scrabble had to be an obscene word. Mm. And if challenged, you had to explain why that word was obscene. <laughs> and of course, it was me taking perfectly normal words and explaining them why they were obscene was what made that game such fun to play. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like uh, I feel like the, the Brits have an advantage because like they you guys can make any word sound sound <laughs> obscene. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so one is Scrabble. Um, Have you played Monopoly Scrabble? No. That's a thing. That's a thing. I have a feeling I wouldn't like that very much. <laughs> um, another is Stratego. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I'd say realistically, maybe it's not truly an eight for me, but there's a lot of nostalgia value there. I played Stratego quite a bit as as a, as a kid. So, yeah, and we do we do have a copy here in the house that I played a few times with my daughter, but she's not a huge fan, but. Yeah, so that, that's another game that probably everybody's played at least once. Um, and the I last the, one for uh, me is... I have the, 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 the Michael Graves version of Stratego that they oh. sold at Target like 20 years ago, the wooden version. Oh, uh, nice. That flips that flips open and has the, the, the pieces inside, lovingly put inside each of those. Yep. Uh, and I never play it, but I, you know, I, I bought it for myself 20 years ago, like Martin says, you know, when, not when board games were crap, but they were just not they were not as you know as as there weren't as many as there are now so like you were just like ooh, a fancy version of a game i used to play as a kid i'll take it yeah 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 um and then the only other one i have rated as high as an eight that is below a seven on bgg is the climbers the which climbers. i think, is, I think yeah. is just a lovely app it's essentially an abstract game yeah um but it's really beautiful has some nice sort of toyetic qualities on the table and it's a good game so it needs to come with a lazy Susan. Uh, you put on a lazy mm. Susan for for gentle gentle turning, so that you can get a view all the way around. Otherwise, you got to get up and you got to you got to get around people and you got to you got to uh, you know nudge people out of the way. I don't want to move when I play a board game. I don't play board games to move. I don't know. That's that's part of fun, though. No? Sit right there. Yeah, maybe, maybe you like moving. This guy doesn't. What else? What else? Who would like to contribute? Well, I've got uh, to throw in there. I I went through it earlier and did the uh, so I've got one of them that's actually related below a six. Oh, wow. um, okay. Big Boss is rated five point nine on the big scale, which is shocking. So Big, big, big Boss, boss? Who, Big Boss. So huh. Big Boss and people who don't know it. It's a Wolfgang Kramer game. And for people who don't know Wolfgang Kramer, he is one of the gods of the German death Wolfgang Kramer. Um, a, a very prolific and capable designer. And he came up with this game back in 1994. And it's a riff on a choir, which is, of course, the great classic from the 60s by Sue Saxon. So you've got this 
um, numbered, well, it's a, a, a loop of numbers. And on these numbers, you have cards that allow you to place blocks which represent pieces of companies. And essentially, you grow companies on this number plot. And as the companies grow, their share price values, and you buy shares in these companies. I'm going inter to interject, interject yeah. for just one second. Importantly, the it's not a grid like in Acquire. Right. It's like a it's like a a, a, like a, a weird box, like a track of numbers all the way around. So yeah. so like card number fifteen is not going to be anywhere near card number forty five, or, or right. you know, spot number fifteen is not going to be anywhere near spot number forty five. Yeah, and the point is, as these companies grow, eventually two will touch each other, and that's a merger, and one takes over the other. Yep. Um, and it's which is really good for the people who've got shares in the bigger company. So it's a fascinating share ownership game as you maneuver the shares in the companies that you, you're working with. And it's it's a fantastic game. It plays in about an hour or so, and it plays up to six players. And a game that plays six players at that kind of time length, that's gold. Um, I mean, I, I know of two others that also are magnificent short six-player games. And they're also both rated below seven. <laughs> on BGG's list, stupidly, which is Medici, which is, you know, possibly the greatest auction game ever that isn't raw, and uh, Transamerica, which is an absolutely fantastic uh, train game. Um, New version of it, Medici just came out, got picked that yeah. up. Right, I mean, yeah, picked that up right away. Yeah, another Medici with crappy um, visual, uh, visual art style. <laughs> it's, it's the person Medici that they always look for. Yeah. But yeah, big. It's shocking to me that Big Boss. I mean, I got it. Somebody brought it over to game day at my house um, about just over a year ago, and I've just bought it right away. I had played it. Oddly enough, it was the first game I ever played on a heavy cardboard stream under the oh, name yeah. Charter House. Um, just as oh, Edward yeah. moved to Boston, but I played with Ken, if I remember correctly. That's right. And, yep. um, I just thought, oh, this is a great game. And then Charter House never really made it over to America. So I was never able to get it easily. But now you can get Big Boss from Amazon, and it's something like 30 bucks or so. It's a steal of a price. And it is a fantastic game. Um, and hits that rare one hour six player spot. I mean, it, it's stupid not to get it. I'm going to I'm going to contribute a little bit and say I respect Big Boss. I bought I heard about it, you know, a lot of it was a lot of people's holy grail game. Uh, and then when Funko of uh, Funko of all kinds, the, the guys who make the little yeah. Funko pops uh uh they released that edition of big boss and I, I i snagged it right up and i bought it and i played it and you know i i i you know like i always do i was like wouldn't i be rather be playing acquire and uh and i i just i decided i liked to acquire a little bit better because i liked uh, you know funnily enough i liked it's kind of more scrabble qualities where you're on this grid rather than the plot around and i also um preferred acquires like merger rules and that kind of thing but I'll tell you what, I don't think Big Boss deserves to be as low as it is when compared to Acquire. I don't think it is. But Martin, do you have BGG up right now? Can you, do you have an easy way of telling what the I, difference is? I can look it up, certainly. Hang yeah, on. I mean, yeah. Acquire is like the number 300 some game. Yeah. Big Boss is quite a bit lower. Yeah, I don't think they deserve to be that far apart. I don't. I, I mean, would also rather Acquire, but I, I would agree that I think it's not it's not a clear-cut answer i think their big boss is better in some ways acquire is better in some ways so agreed acquire also notably a six-player game plays up to six i wouldn't play it with six i mean if i if i i guess if i wouldn't hate playing it with six but i feel like it would be a little too chaotic at six um i think i think five is the most i would play four is the sweet spot mm, for acquire i think i think four is really really good John, what yeah, about you? Seven yep. is uh, seven point one, I think it was. I'll oh yeah, yeah. yeah no seven reason point for one. the two of them to be so far apart. Yeah. So prior to this conversation, uh, I didn't realize there was an average rating and a geek rating. I didn't. I didn't know that. Um, but anyway, I, I had several. I'll fly through three real quick. Um, first off, uh, use get your pointy finger uh, ready there, Paul. Uh, weather machine. Um, it's geek rating at six point eight, and I know. Weather Machine specifically got a lot of flack about the theme. Yeah. But I think it's a wonderful game. I mean, I really do. And I, I personally think the theme ties together 
um, in a really interesting way. I mean, you're an academic, you're not trying to fix the weather, but you're trying to publish papers and uh, lobby the government. And uh, I just think it's great. It's, it's one of my favorites of his and I've played it about 15 times now and it plays great at all player counts. And I, I get a lot of arguments about that. And uh, Martin has his hand up. Yeah. Martin, um, Martin raise your hand. <laughs> yes, sir. Martin, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, what I always say with Weather Machine is that the setting undermines the theme. Hmm. And this is so, for those that I always have to go through this, Dan Farrell makes this, this, this distinction between setting and theme, where the setting is sort of what the art's like and that kind of thing. So, Ra, for instance, its setting is Egypt. But a theme has to do with a mechanism. So there's no theme in Ra, um, but it's to do with are the actions that you're doing the kind of actions you would expect. And the thing with Weather Machine is the setting is all about changing the weather in this kind of alter reality history like world. But the theme is just the academic process. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is that the, everybody gets focused on the weather aspect of the game. And, and doesn't really understand why they're not really doing anything with the weather and that they're not actually doing anything to change the weather. Well, it's not about that. It's about publishing papers and doing research and getting government funding and all of that stuff. But it kind of gets lost. And I didn't understand this until, until Vital actually explained it to us. But he said, yeah, that's my idea is to the academic process. And I just needed a, a, a setting to sort of, you know, because it could be any scientific process. And so he picked this fantastical weather setting but unfortunately, at least for me, it overwhelmed my view of it. So I want to play Weather Machine again with my knowledge now of the true theme of the game, because I think I would have a different opinion of it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I got two things. One is uh, I'm in software. Martin, obviously, you're in software. You have a software background. Um, and uh, uh, John, Ken, I admit, I don't fully know what you guys do for a living. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, as someone who uh, works in technology, uh, I would never recommend anyone use technology for anything because uh, it always breaks. And so <laughs> when when trying to use the weather machine, to, when trying to fix the, the bad weather that the weather machine has created, I think if I'm right, there, it's possible that you could just make the weather worse, right? Like you you make it bad in one, or fix it in one place and it just gets worse somewhere else. And that's what I, happens. Yeah. I, I think I think that's kind of like that. That seems to me a little accurate in 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 real life. It's a bummer for the theme of the right for the theme or the setting of the game where it's like help help Doctor Lati fix the weather. And it's like <laughs> you sweet <laughs> summer child in, in summer when it happens to be snowing, right? Like, uh, and then uh, the other thing I have completely forgot. So never mind. Well, I and a funny anecdote about that, um, speaking of uh, Vital, um, on his Discord, I was talking to him and some others about a, a play we had of that. My wife did abysmally um, in one game, and because she went to the government quite a bit, um, the government actions. And then uh, Vital said, never trust the government. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so it seemed very thematic, uh, thematically appropriate that she lost as a result of giving too much to that area so oh that i remember the second thing yeah. it was the academic process it was it was you know publishing papers and working through that and i think i think we were mentioning earlier about about uh in inventions um i think that also captures a little bit of that feel right someone has an idea someone needs to propose it someone needs to invent it and then someone needs to share it with the world mm -hmm. uh and i and i i can't help but wonder if um if vital uh was like you know i don't think people quite got what i was getting at with weather machine you know i've got this idea for another game and what if you know what if i really hit it more square on the head about like about the idea process and publishing it and bringing it out into the world apparently right. everyone here but me has just like hangs out with vital all the time and talks uh, about and everything uh, buddy buddy but uh you know one of these days one of these days i'll give him a high five yeah and then and then the two others complete opposite end of the spectrum much like um Ken Stratego um, uh, ranking uh, more of a sentimental value is a game called Morels. Um, oh yeah, the mushrooms. And I have it highly rated, probably more than it deserves. Um, but you know, we are going to talk about um, either tonight or some other time about board games being art, and I think there's some type of emotional art connected to, to board games. But 
Um, I don't know when I, I got my wife this game Morels for um, Christmas like three years ago, and we had not been in the hobby or maybe four years ago, and we played that game, and it's been off the races ever since. Hmm. Yeah. So Morels played a pivotal role in me really getting into the hobby of board gaming, and I'll always be grateful to it for that. It's a it's a simple set collection game. You're walking through the forest, you're collecting mushrooms. You know, nothing spectacular, but to me, it's super important. You know. Um, and then the third game is a game called, uh, by Mr. Rosenberg called uh, Spring Meadow, um, oh, yeah. which is part of his kind of three polyomino series uh, with Indian Summer and Cottage Garden. But I just think Spring Meadow is delightful. It's easy, breezy, um, very green. It's nice to play in the springtime and kind of you just got your, your polyomino Tetris pieces and you're doing your own little puzzle and it's, it's just relaxing. Um, it, I think it's the lowest rated out of those three, but uh, I, I think it's very enjoyable and there's a nice challenge to it. So was that the one where the goal is to finish first or am I thinking of Indian summer? Um, don't remember. Indian summer is a race. Yeah. Yeah. And spring meadows not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then over oh. if, if we, um, the cool, we are we changing, uh, pop, pop it here or no, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we do. I want to contribute one, a couple of things, and then, and then okay. because I, I feel like I need to tell everybody about this game, uh, uh, not just because I like talking, but I mean I do. But um, where is it? Oh, where is it? Oh, I just moved it. Here it is. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. Uh, Houston, we have a dolphin. Uh, this yeah. is this is rated. Where is it? Houston, we have a dolphin. So if we look at average rating, it's six point nine which is the 6.9 is the number you see when you when you click on the game and look at the game itself in, in Board Game Geek. Um, but the geek rating is lower than I think anybody's here, 5.5. Uh, um, this is a social deduction game. And, you know, someone called out in the videos that I released that I, don't, I tend to be very haphazard with whether the, <laughs> uh, the front or the, or the back are, are uh, oriented the same. Um, it is a social deduction game that uses cards um, and the idea is that if you picture, um, if you, if you, the setup is that it is an alternate past in which there's a space station uh, and uh, dolphins have inf infiltrated the space station and they are trying to uh, flood the space station and, and, and then eject everybody out of the airlock for some unknown reason. Um, so I, it's an historical war game. Yeah, it's a historical. Yeah. yeah it's a GMT is uh, was going right. to publish it, but they, they passed on it. Um, <laughs> But the, this, the, 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 the core loop of the game is that you have like the space station is represented by like a triangle. And at every point of the triangle, everyone's going to play a card. And, um, and, and the cards are not known to anybody but the app. And so it is an app powered game, which might be one of the reasons why it's so low. You, you um, scan the card, the, the camera on your phone recognizes the card the art on the card. And it's very good at doing it. It's kind of hit or miss if you've ever played these, these app-driven games that recognize art on a card. Some of them use QR codes and others are very good at recognizing the card itself. Um, and you, you play these cards uh, on this triangle and the cards can affect the person to their left and they can affect the person to their right. And they, they sometimes will only affect one and sometimes they'll affect both. The idea is that every round there's a captain, kind of like in the resistance or that kind of thing. And the captain chooses who's going to go on the mission. And the whole point is that you have to fix the space station and you fix the space station ostensibly by everyone who is definitely not a dolphin playing cards to coordinate. Like if I, you know, ostensibly, John, if you and I were, were, were humans and, and Ken were a dolphin. I, if I, you know, if I know you're a human or I hope you're a human, I'm going to play a card to point A on the triangle. You're going to play a card to point B on the triangle. And the, the two cards that we play will result in you and me hooking up successfully and fixing a part of the space station. Um, but if it turns out that you're a dolphin, you can actually secretly play a card that does not help me or that does not help and ends up not only not helping, but also murdering me. Um, and so the, the app knows who's played what cards to what areas, and then it does a little bit, it, it does a little bit of randomization and, uh, so that the result is not the same every time and then says, okay, whoever played a card, well, I know who played a card uh, the, uh, you know, Paul, you played a card into spot a, you die. And, um, and so there's, there's all this deduction that needs to happen. 
Um, and, and then over the course of the game, everyone gains panic. And that's where the real thrust of the game is. It's a little bit like Among Us. If anyone has played or is familiar yeah. with the computer game Among Us, um, uh, there, there's, you know, everyone has to now have a meeting and decide, all right, who gets thrown out the airlock? You know, do we overthrow the captain because we think maybe the captain is a dolphin? Um, all that works together in this nice, tight little, this nice, tight little, tight little game here that uh, that is snappy and it, it offers a really good three to five player social deduction experience. Normally, a three-player social deduction experience is like, who cares? But because it's app-driven, I think it 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 uh, it works really well. And the only reason I've babbled so much about it is because I think it's, it was only available at a Kickstarter by this little company, H H Y B R. I think they maybe still sell sell it on their website or not. I really, really hope. I haven't checked into them lately. I really hope they're still around because this is. I think this game just didn't get the 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 attention it deserves. It's it's got this really cool art style. And maybe the fact that it's app driven, I know that's very divisive. Uh, some of the, you know, Dark Tower, Alchemist, some of the the, the best games I have are app driven, and I, you know, people want to get away from it. But rated comically low on BGG, and uh, and that's a it's a real bummer for me. Uh, and I've you know I got a couple other games, but there, I don't think I think I've I've talked long long enough. I just mainly, uh, you know, I just wanted to talk about this so that I could just hold up this a bunch of times so that people could see that this is a, this is a really good game. I really enjoy it. It's fun. And it had to be a dolphin, right? That's not pasted on. No, no, it is. It, <laughs> it had to be. Yeah. It has it has to it has to be a, a dolphin. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise a, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Social deduction for three players. There is no such thing on earth, but there is in space. Uh that's what it says <laughs> on the back of the box. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, John, I do want to thank you for stealing my thunder for the final topic for this round table. Uh, uh, I was trying to segue, but oh yeah, yeah. Was... has raised his hand. Yeah, yeah. I, I, wanted, I had another game I wanted to mention. So Please go ahead. Um, so yeah, so also at low on that list, at a mere six point one, is what for me is the best game that I've played so far that has been uh, produced in the twenty twenties. Um, which is Seize the Bean, which is this super little, uh, super game about building coffee shops in Berlin um, with a really interesting combination of deck building and engine building where you've got a very, you've got a constantly tricky choice between do I buy the coffee supplies that I need to satisfy my customers or do I expand the capabilities of my coffee shop? Um, with and the game, one of the great things about the game, it's just fantastic humorous art in there because the various kinds of customers you can have hipsters, you can have tourists, you can have workaholics, and they all have these special things that they're interested in, you know, exposed brick for the hipsters or whatever. And a beautiful range of cards for the various upgrades you can do for your coffee shop to attract these different kinds of customers. And a really interesting gameplay as to how you how do you combine the hipsters and the cycle um, delivery, the uh, cycle messengers, in order to get the things to go to get your engine to pop? Um, I mean, it's a it's really lovely game, beautifully put together, um, and also with a lot of stuff to explore. The, the, the game varies in a similar way to Dominion in that you get a bunch of decks that you play with. Um, you play with six different categories of customers and the game comes with about 20 of them from the kickstarter and i've only other than one time i've only ever played with base six but i've had enormous fun with those gates base six i could happily play it tons of times and i really want to explore the rest of the game but i just don't get the opportunity um and it's such a shame because it's such a really really good game um and i just wanted to call it out because it's a recent game it's an absolute cracker um, and it's not high up on the ratings because not that many people have come across it. Yeah, why do you think it's, is it because it just doesn't have um, the exposure, or do you think that maybe there's, like, you know, like I said with app games, like there's just a certain category of people who just don't like it, and they feel compelled to to rate it low? Well, I think it's, it's more a case of it doesn't have, it didn't have a huge um, print run. Mm. Um, it had a Kickstarter that was somewhat problematic because, I mean, the thing is, they have these customer cards, 
uh, they're all basically the same thing on the customer cards, but every single card's got individual art on it. Mm. So uh, the costs of doing that were must have been ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it was a real labor of love game. And so there are not that many copies of it out there. And I think that is a major factor. If you can't get it at the moment, uh, it's out of print. And who knows if they're ever going to reprint it. When you, um, when you said Seize the Bean, I thought we were playing Dirty Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> Although um, I'm, I'm sure I could get Seize and Bean to be um, playing on that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't know. I, it's one of those games that, you know, there's, there's a million games out there. So lots of them get lost in the noise. But this one just, and I bumped into it completely by accident, and I've, uh, I continue to love it. Yeah, it's, um, it's a 7.6, you know, when, like I said, when you click on a game and you see that number right next to the name, you know, 7.6, but, uh, they, but they don't factor that into the rank overall. They, that's where they use their, their geek ranking or their geek rating. And that ends up putting it at uh, 2,390 down on the list. Which is, uh, I guess, sounds like it's unfortunate. I haven't played it, but uh, it's yeah. unfortunate. As, 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 as someone who is, I, I was, I was in on the one play of Martin's Seize the Bean copy where we played a non-standard set because I've, I've now played it multiple times too. Um, it's clear how much variability there is in those customer decks yeah. just from that trying that one different set. Um, and I think that I, I, I am curious to explore that game more too. So, but also. I can attest not a lot of copies in the wild. It's hard to find because I've been trying to find it to buy it. Yeah. So uh, I want to get back to the the final topic of the evening um, that again, I, I want to call out again. Oh, Ken. Uh, unfortunately, I think I, I think I have to go guys. Sorry. Okay. Ken's Ken's going to tap out. Okay. Yeah. Well, Hey, uh, good talking. And Thanks for having me. Bye, Ken. See you, soon. Have, I'll see you guys soon. Do you have a second to explain what's in that door there over your shoulder? That uh, that one, yeah. Is that is that where is that where the students go when they've? Been... It's a it's a utility shaft of some kind. <laughs> some... <laughs> that's where he's going to keep Twilight Struggle Collector's Edition. That's right. Or yeah, it doesn't fit in there, sadly. That's where he's going to put Edward when uh, when he gets <laughs> that's his. That's right. Gets After I cut him up into very small pieces. <laughs> oh, really? All right, Ken. Good talking oh. with you. Have a good night, guys. Bye, Enjoy, Enjoy the rest of the conversation. Will do. It won't. It won't be too long. Uh, well, uh, the two of us. Let's. Uh, I, I kind of. I feel like we've we've danced around it, but I would love to just get some final thoughts on this. Um, uh, we like board games. We talk about setting. We talk about theme. We talk about how well things capture one or the other or reflect on one or the other. Earlier, John, you had talked about Hollenspiel games. Uh, moving forward and uh, the cloth of the, the field of cloth of gold um what i wanted to to float out there um as kind of a, a final talk here is um roger ebert at one point you know back when he was alive said uh video games can never be art and um the best he would ever concede is like the assets the, you know the the visual assets can be art and the music can be art and the script can be art but the game itself can never be art and you know it's about you know it's, it's about a decade too late for him to take that back um because i think there's some plenty plenty of good video games out there where the where when you think about it the rules themselves trying to communicate something to you by 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 forcing you to do a thing in a certain way makes a statement um uh i will float out a couple of examples and then i'll give both of you guys the last word um i think a really good example is uh modern art which is right here, this modern art right here. And actually not this modern art, um, the, the Mayfair version of modern art where they, I think they invented artists and like had someone come up with fake art and gave them like some of the, you know, gave them silly names or, or pretentious names. And the whole point of the game is that we're all bidding on art that is fundamentally worthless until people start buying it. And then you realize, oh wait, you know, this artist is actually starting to, wait, people are buying this artist. What do they know that I don't know? I want to get in on that artist. And, and it, I think it is one of the earliest examples for as long as I've been in the hobby of like rules really communicating a, a point of view, a clear statement, a clear point of view to me about a thing, um, about, the, about the, the human condition or the way the world is. Another game like that is a Ponzi Scheme, which I have down here on the floor. I will not go down and go get it. But Ponzi Scheme is such a beautiful distillation of like how easy it is to want the abstract thing that the game presents you 
you are you are a business or you're a, a, some kind of entity who just wants these things and you're willing to get into debt to get them and you're willing to get thirty dollars as long you know on on the terms that you have to pay back fifteen dollars every three turns you know and in eventually you get to the point where you just have to keep taking out loans so that you can pay back your old loans and then eventually someone goes bankrupt and the game ends and whoever uh, whoever went bankrupt can't win, I think, if I recall correctly. It's been a while since I've played it. Uh, but the what I what resonates with me strongly is um, just how much of how much of uh, reflective of the treadmill that it's real, real easy to get on when when, you know, I've been watching a lot of financial audit videos on YouTube where this guy comes in and brings in like younger people and yells at them for their spending habits, mainly because of their lifestyle inflation, where it's like, Oh, you got a better job, which meant you had you needed to have a better car. Oh, and now you had to take out a personal payday loan in order to pay off that car. Oh, you had to take out another payday loan in order to and and Ponzi scheme really, you know, from a different perspective, it really captures that. It's a great another great example of of art uh, or game rules as art. And that and all this is not this notwithstanding a game like John Company by Cole Worley, uh, where he very clearly in his design diaries was like, I made this game to show like you know what it feel what it would what it, what it must feel like or you know to express the point of view of running this this big company um with all the the infighting and the the struggling between everybody those are good examples to me of of games as art um there's clever mechanisms that kind of thing but then there's there's just every now and then a game comes along where you're like these rules just perfectly encapsulate what it's trying to get across do either of you have any examples of uh something like that and we can give the two of you the final word on that um uh, yeah sure i'll let martin have the last word um i don't i don't have many specific examples and art is incredibly subjective obviously um but i absolutely view board games as art and the reason i do so is because i i think art it's art if it elicits some type of response right and whether that response is good or bad or beautiful or ugly or comfortable or uncomfortable there is no doubt in my mind that board games in general whether you like them or not elicit some type of response um it could be a spiritual response it could be a response of even just like a, a visual response of uh, how amazing is this production or you know in your example of john company like this theme is making me very uncomfortable yeah um uh or you know we were playing weimar and you know we're sitting there thinking okay do i want these five victory points yeah. uh and help out the nsdap <laughs> yeah. or do i you know it, it, it challenges challenges us in such a way that it can't be anything else but art um and it's to someone who hasn't really experienced um board games in the way we do because we we're so deep into the hobby i think that's probably a hard sell um but the the world that awaits um just dive, diving into this and feeling that art um kind of happen to you um is, is really beautiful and i that's why i think there's no doubt in my mind that board games are not art um yeah so that's what i have on that martin you get the last word yeah, I mean, I think when you hit this first, the thing is that it, well, it all depends on how do we define art, right? Um, and one way of defining it is to say it changes your perspective of the wider world or attempts to change your perspective, present a perspective on the wider world that you may not have run into. And this is where the designers who are really interested in social commentary come to the fore. So you mentioned Carl Worley, obviously John Company, but also an infamous traffic. Um, Pax Pamir um, is all about social commentary. I mean, a, a very strong um, designer in that level is Annabelle Holland. I mean, she's produced yep. all sorts of games that are very much about her view, and often very deeply personal. I mean, the recent one about um, the tobacco industry. Um, that, oh, yeah. that, that was our product. Really yep. bit close to her um, because it was her, you know, she was thinking of her father with that one. Yeah. And um, I mean, that that's and and I think you I agree with you. Momnath also gives that sense, even from Kinixia, who's always criticised for not being very thematic. He was extremely thematic in that game, and I think you know does say a lot about things. So I think and, and that dimension of art 
it's not the majority of board games certainly that go down that that um perspective of the world but there is definitely a strong strand of social commentary board game designers out there that are doing really great work at the moment and and sometimes a little bit in a very indirect way one great example of this is jason perez's work with puerto rico right where you get the original puerto rico game which is oblivious of the history of puerto rico and sure. slavery and all the rest of it and then jason perez takes that raw material and says by pitching it exactly into 1897 i can make a statement about how i think we want to think about puerto rico in the world um in a way that was actually quite controversial because people were criticizing him for putting it in this non-slavery period as it were get get your politics out of my see that reaction yeah so he's what i think what he did was brilliant yeah I mean, it's a total tragedy that alia screwed up the production of the game in all sorts of ways yeah but i mean i think what he did was a brilliant artistic statement based on something that completely was oblivious to the social background in there but having said that and said yes i think the social commentary part is an important part i think even without the social commentary and this is the point that, that john was getting to there is a point about board games being an art form even without that because they they create this environment for interaction between people and uh, i'm very much of the you know i don't like the sit on your own come up with a grand plan and basically you can ignore everybody else style games most of the time i like games that are heavily interactive which is why i like games say like age of steam that are wonderfully interactive and the point is that these kind of games they set up this interpersonal relationships and they they put you in this position of thinking about where you are but also they allow you to admire the mechanisms of the thinking i mean if you look at all the various age of steam maps i mean it's just a fascinating thing to see how each each designer will take a take the basic ideas of this game tweak them a little bit set them to a particular landscape and create this slightly variant form and it's just interesting to see how they do that and a lot of us that are regular gamers we like watching how game mechanics work and how they fit together and how they do or don't fit with a the theme there's a lot of stuff there that i think is uh, it, it can be i think quite reasonably considered to be art it makes us it absorbs us it allows us to um, have experiences that otherwise we wouldn't have and that's that's a different kind of thinking about art to the social commentary side of the game um but i think in itself has its own value as well i think um i i i'm you know when we when you hear people who've been maybe in the hobby as long as us kind of grouse a little bit about how there's starting to feel like there's nothing new under the sun we're just getting these kind of endless iterations on the same mechanisms over and over and over again um when you then think about the the direction that someone like an Amabel Holland or a Cole Worley or a Jason Perez, um, I'll, I'll, I just blanked on his name. I, I, I'm hopefully, J, is it Jason Perez? Jason, I, I Perez, like, I think, Jason yeah. Perez. Yes, thank you. Um, when you think about that, um, that is a direction, right? When you're like, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, maybe what if instead of trying to just come up with a new way to roll these dice or a new way to collect this set of cards what if instead we got started man how exciting would it be to to just start seeing a, a crop of games where they're about subjects that make you that make you feel something beyond just like oh this is an abstraction of what it was like to be a renaissance trader you know in beige town uh and that is what is exciting for me um I've got downstairs, I've got Pax Premier, I've got uh, John Company, I've got Weimar. Um, they're not on the shelf here because by and large, most people who come in and see this shelf, they're not ready for those, right? Not yet. Um, I'm not, if someone comes in like, oh, wow, what are those? Oh, these are board games. Do you wanna play Weimar, the game about, you know, saving the, the you know, the, the German Republic and uh, the time, you know, lead up to the Nazis? Like, no, I'm not gonna do that. But how great would it be if in another 10 years or so, like we start seeing that kind of, um, and I use the word activism, but not in, maybe not in the way we think about, but in the way of like, 
uh, instead of coming up with new mechanisms, instead coming up with new meaning behind them. I think that I think that would be a great step forward if if you know someone like an Amabel Holland or a Cole Worley or someone their games just started becoming way more mass market and way less niche. I think we'd all be better for it. John, raise the hand. Yeah, and in, and in this framework, I had not, not thought of this until you guys brought it up. Heavy gar cardboard really is um, a gallery, right? I mean, the way that heavy cardboard showcases these games yeah. in ways that other, you know, maybe content creators don't. It's we're a, it's a gallery. I mean, we're we're showing artwork in a, in a light that um, otherwise may not have been shown. I might Which be pretty little, cool. I might be a little too humble to uh, to agree too, uh, you know, vocally with that to pat my pat pat myself or us. Well, it's not given, me. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially given how new I am to the group, but I think you're absolutely me right. Me too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're right. Well, gentlemen, uh, this has been a pleasure. It has gone way smoother than I thought. Um, there was a lot less uh, a cat, uh, you know, screaming in the background than I thought there would be. So. Big ups to our cat for uh, leaving leaving me alone. Oh, that was a cat. I thought it was a. <laughs> you thought it was that. What did you think it was, Edward? No. <laughs> uh, so I think I think with that, I think maybe we can sign off. Any last yeah. words, or, or is that is that about it? No, uh, thanks, Paul. I think yeah. and uh, yeah, just thank you for everything you're doing. Hey. Seriously, I know I said Ooh. that to you on Slack, but yeah. It's well, no, awesome. no problem. I'm I'm happy to contribute. I've been looking for ways to contribute, and I'm glad that I was able to kind of uh, you know fill a little bit of a of a gap all Edward's gone. And I'm sure Edward's grateful for it too. I mean, as far as I know, nothing like this has happened before, right? No, man, so. he's been trying to change the password of the YouTube account for four days. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I know this because all those all those password change emails keep coming to me because I changed the, the email address on it. Wait, I am <laughs> curious though, are, is he approving like Kyle in, in, in the videos first? Or I don't you think just... Edward ever approves of Kyle. Um, but, well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, he kind of to his man to his credit, he said, "Look, I trust you. Follow your wow. heart." I, I did. I showed him. Uh, I showed him uh, my video that I released first uh, yeah. before I before I released it. He said, "This is great." I said, "Great. Do you you know do are you okay with me just kind of doing what I feel like needs to be done for each of the ones that get?" And he said, "Yes, absolutely." So okay, because so mine's kind of dark. I don't know. No, yours is fine. Yours is okay. going to be just fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Uh, All right. Great. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for being a part of this. And thanks to Ken. He had to go early. We ran a little long, I guess. You could look at it one way or the other. But in any case, thanks to you, viewer, for watching. And uh, make sure to like and subscribe. And uh, send, me your thumbs. send us your thumbs. Put them in boxes. You could send them via parcel post. Tell the USPS that they're textbooks uh, and hope that they don't open it up and find a bunch of thumbs because you get in trouble. You'll, they'll, they'll charge you more. They'll send them back to you and you don't want that. So thank you very much. And uh, see you guys later.